Thank you all so much for being here, and thank you to our guest, Mr. Jones, for being here. I'm Jenny Levine, Humanities and Adult Programming Coordinator for Durham County Library. This program is sponsored by the Durham Library Foundation and the American Dance Festival, celebrating 40 years here in Durham. <laughs> We always have great programs coming up, so please check out our brochures. Restrooms, should you need them, are back in the hall behind me. And if you enjoyed today's program, uh, we would appreciate you filling out an evaluation form on your way out and letting us know your thoughts. Mr. Bill T. Jones is an American choreographer and dancer who, with Arnie Zane, created the Bill T. Jones Arnie Zane Dance Company. There's so much biographical information on him, I had a hard time choosing what to say. There's even an entry in the Encyclopedia Britannica, which as a librarian, I couldn't help but gravitate toward. <laughs> Here are some snippets of the life of this phenomenal individual. Mr. Jones was the ninth of 12 children of migrant farm workers. His parents moved from rural Florida when he was three, and he grew up in Wayland, New York, just south of Rochester. He attended the State University of New York at Binghamton, where he became interested in movement and dance. There he met Arnie Zane, who became his partner in business and in life. In the wake of Mr. Zane's death and the death of another member of the company, Mr. Jones created some of his most powerful works, including Last Supper at Uncle Tom's Cabin, The Promised Land, 1990, and Still Here, 1994. In 2007, Jones earned a Tony Award for Best Choreography for his work in the musical Spring Awakening. Jones received a number of honors throughout his career, including a MacArthur Fellowship in 1994, the Dorothy and Lillian Gish Prize, 2003, and a Kennedy Center Honor, 2010. His memoir, Last Night on Earth, 1995, with Peggy Gillespie, is a compelling narrative that reveals issues that animated and motivated him. Clearly, Mr. Jones has a strong connection with literature and the expression of ideas from the page to the stage. The work that brings us here today, The Emigrants by W.G. Sebald, is an enormously impressive piece of literature, and I look forward to seeing it take form tonight under Mr. Jones' creative guidance. I'm so grateful for the tremendous amount of brilliant artistic expression the American Dance Festival brings to our community, and I'm beyond thrilled that I get to be even a small part of it. I'm also very grateful to the page, Maurice, who helped me set up all these chairs today. <laughs> And to Theresa May, librarian, who's been very helpful today. Uh, it's my distinct honor to introduce Mr. Bill T. Jones. Mm -hmm. And may I suggest that you two use that one and I use this one? Yes. Mm -hmm. Hello, everyone. Uh, yes, thank you so much for being out today. And I apologize, um, being a show person, that you we're not higher than you are. Um, uh, maybe if I had um, hung out the last 15 minutes rather than getting stage fright, and we should have worked on that. You wouldn't by have stool, by any chance have stools, would you? I think we do. Why don't you get three stools, three stools, so we can at least give you give your neck a break, <laughs> right? And I'd like to introduce uh, Adrian Silber, um, who is the uh, dramaturg of uh, Ambrose, um, Analogy Ambrose, and you also contributed to Lance, didn't you? Yes. In the as a dramaturg. So I've done a few things like this over the years, so I know something about it. Right. So um, I'm just I'm here to um, to jump in. How many people here have actually read the book? Ah, a literate group. Um, how could we? Maybe I'll let the, my uh, associate here lead the discussion because how could we bring everybody up to speed about what the book is about? I did not have a synopsis prepared, but I think also as we go along with the discussion, mm -hmm. we get an idea uh, a bit about what's involved. A very, very brief synopsis is um, my description. Um, it's a very true-to-life account, this is the whole book, of four Jewish lives directly affected by World War II. It's just a very basic. Um, mm -hmm. And it, it really dives in very deeply. These people are very, very real. Um, mm -hmm. 
if we want to stick to just talking about Ambrose, then we could talk about. Mm -hmm. Well, let's just talk about Ambrose, which is already curious. Yeah, curious the description would be for Jewish lives, since Ambrose is German, and the person Cosmo, who actually seems to be a secondary character, is the Jew in the story. So this description is peculiar, that it's about four Jewish lives. The title of the book that is called Ambrose Edelwart. In three of them, three out of the four characters are Jewish in the book. Ambrose Edelwart um, is a young working class Jewish, you know, working class Jew, uh, German man who we um, meet in 1951 for, at the, when he is coming back to Germany to, uh, for a family reunion. And the narrator, who is never really identified other than he, he says I, many of us assume that the narrator is Siebald himself, who was in fact German, and uh, ended up uh, teaching in, uh, I believe, East Anglia and England, writing in German. And I believe The Immigrants was his first book tr uh, translated and published in, in English. In English. So we meet this Ambrose Edelwart, who is a, a precocious. He um, has a tough childhood. He leaves his family and heads out to become a very high-level um, um, manservant. He works at the Savoy. He has a pretty amazing life, but he is extremely discreet. He's always buttoned up. He never speaks about himself. We are led in an artful way to believe by the narrator that he has had a normal life in the sense that they mentioned the lady from Shanghai, that he, who he, uh, at the Savoy Hotel, and um, there was something going on with the lady from Shanghai. She's never mentioned again in the book. And then the Japanese delegate who takes him back in a dubious role to live in a house in the middle of a lake outside of Kyoto. Romantic, right? We don't know. They, he's partially a servant and partially a guest of this man. Never any more mention of the delegate. Then we find out that he has come in 1911 to uh, the US. He can speak five languages. He has a gift for languages. And he um, comes to the US and he, after a while, is introduced to um, Mr. Uh, Solomon. Uh, the first name? Sam. Samuel Solomon, who was one of the, 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 the uh, head of one of the richest Jewish banking families in, the, in New York at that time, who was very impressed with Ambrose, and he has a project for him. And the project is called Cosmo. Cosmo uh, Solomon is a peculiar character. He's like just out of the movies. He, he uh, is spoilt. He has an unlimited banking account. And his father is concerned about him. He needs somebody to take care of him. Cosmo, they try to cut back Cosmo's allowance. And um, Cosmo comes up with his own plan that he knows how he can make unlimited money. They're going to gamble. And he is a bit of a savant, which is never, is with a very light touch. He, I think he counts in his head probabilities at the roulette table. And he makes a lot of money. They cut quite a, a figure in, in Europe, in all the great places, uh, Monte Carlo. Deauville is the center of the novel. Deauville was the chicest place to be gambling at that time in the, uh, the when did they go, 1913 for the first time? Yeah? 1911 for the first time. Uh, okay, well, 1911, uh-huh. Uh, but there's something mysterious about them. They are never, re they're very popular, very much talked about. It must have been very glamorous to men. Were they brothers? Were they employer and uh, employee? Was it something else? Co uh, Ambrose always stands behind Cosmo's chair, very erect, bringing him a cup of consomme, watching over him. Because Ambrose says that when he's gambling, he goes into a kind of uh, trance. All of this is novelistic stuff, and I won't, I'm getting kind of bogged down in all the, the details that I am so absorbed with. Um, but what happens is uh, they, on the eve of World War I, they make a trip to what an important character, Aunt Finney, describes as the Holy Land. Aunt Finney and Uncle Casimir are the only ones that are left who remember him. He came, uh, as uh, Uncle Casimir tells us, Ambrose was already 40 years old when he came in 1928-29 to find work. Echoes of the era we live in, 
because Uncle uh, Casimir says that there was no place for people like us in Germany at that time, the real Germans, except when the Jews put a copper roof on the synagogue in Augsburg. Wow, so in this story, uh, Jewish people are privileged people. This is all, um, well, we all know it's coming. The characters don't know it's coming. Certainly, uh, Cosmo didn't know it was coming. Ambrose would live through the Second World War, but there's no mention in the book about the Second World War. The focus is on um, the mystery of the man, how his relatives describe him, and what I took to be the happiest summer of their life. That is, the record is an agenda book that Ambrose has given to Aunt Finney when she was a young, a recent immigrant. And it is written in five or six languages in a, in a very meticulous hand. And he is writing about their daily life of traveling, Constantinople, the coast of Delphi, uh, ending up in Jerusalem, which incidentally happens to be a place that Cosmo detests. <sighs> How am I doing? <laughs> yeah. Well, they get back. They come, they come back uh, during the war, World War I, back home to, New, uh, to Long Island. And this wild Cosmo is having real problems re-entering into society. He doesn't say hello to his friends anymore. He spends uh, most of his time uh, in, the, in, in the Summer Villa, which is this place that uh, likewise his father will later retreat to. One day, um, he, is, uh, he has a nervous breakdown in which he imagines that he is in the war in Europe and he is in the trenches, and he is cudgeling rats, and he is the horror of it. And um, of course, his guardian is Ambrose, and they have had this wonderful summer together. He um, recovers, and they go to a movie, um, a German movie in New York, and it's a movie that is called, I think it's called, uh, there's a real silent movie called Dr. Mabuse, Dr. Mabuse right? The wonderful thing about um, Siebold, and what is so difficult to synopsize him, is the delicious details that he drops. This is a real silent movie, expressionist silent movie, but it fits into a really convincing narrative uh, structure. Cosmo sees this movie, and there's a scene wherein a caravan, can you imagine? A caravan appears and comes forward, but in Cosmo's mind, or is it real, the caravan comes off the screen, off the stage, passes and goes up the aisle, and he goes out following it and gets lost. Well, make of it what you will. Did he have a breakdown or did something happen? Um, he becomes more and more depressed. One day he's found at the top of the house uh, he's been missing for days, standing on a chair, looking up at the roof. And uh, Ambrose says, what are you doing up here? He says, I came up here to see my brother. He never had a brother. He um, curls up into a ball during the day. He's crying. He's got his handkerchief in his teeth. And he descends into, what do you want to call it? Some would have said madness. Others would say deep depression. We live in another era. And a lot of this piece, this story, is about how we name things. And you'll see in our piece tonight, we take on that issue of why, do, why are words used and how do words come in and out of fashion. Um, Ambrose takes him to, the, um, to Ithaca, New York. I, I grew up um, about 40 miles from Ithaca. So I'm, a part of me is very much attached to uh, upstate New York, but there's a I think it's an imaginary sanitarium. Um, and uh, Cosmo dies there. 27 years go by, just in a paragraph. And, he, and uh, Mr. Ambrose is the butler for the Solomons. And he, over time, um, Mr. Solomon dies, leaves him a house. Mrs. Solomon, who is quite a piece of work, uh, you have to hear her description something that Lana Turner would have played in a movie, uh, or maybe Bette Davis. Um, and she dies. The house is sold off. Ambrose um, is alone 
in an impeccably clean house that the Salomons have left in. And at first, he wants to talk all the time to Aunt Finney. She's telling us all of this, meanwhile, all the time about these amazing things. She thinks he's even suffering from Korsakov syndrome. Had you ever heard of it, Korsakov syndrome? He, he, Siebold is his way of dropping a term, Korsakov syndrome, in which a person substitutes um, lost memories with outlandish creations. Uh, well, so he wants to talk all the time, and then about two years later, he's gotten to the point where literally um, to remember anything, to say it, is painful. And he becomes, in a way, catatonic, wouldn't you say? He sits in a chair with one hand on his desk, impeccably dressed always, shoe shined, cravat, and looking at the floor. And the Aunt Finney says, as if he were waiting for somebody to call, but no one ever did. Who would, she said. Strange, huh? What does she mean, who would? OK, um, his life after Cosmo sort of froze. He himself, on Christmas Day, the day after Christmas, of course, leaves her a note, says, have gone to Ithaca. Love, Ambrose. He uh, commits himself to the Samaria Sanatorium and is subjected to a brutal regime of electroconvulsive therapy, shock therapy. And uh, literally, his joints freeze. It takes him hours to get dressed. You read it, huh? No, I'm just familiar with DCT, so. Oh, I see, yeah. He, um, no, I understand. <laughs> well, I, I guess it's been, it's been uh, uh, what's the word? Um, not resuscitated, when, you, when your reputation, I'm sorry, when your reputation has been rehabilitated, the, the, the procedure. But for many years, we thought it was literally a kind of, kind of torture. Um, he um, dies there, um, evermore, not able to speak, having problem with his eyes, spending the whole day getting dressed. And he insists on get, shining his shoes, the cravat, the whole bit. <clears throat> and uh, um, he would go down, have this therapy diligently, and then make his way painfully back to his room, undress. And he does this day after day until they find him one day, completely dressed, lying on the bed, and dead. So what happened? You know, what happened? The book, uh, we learned this from a Dr. Uh, Abramsky, who does remember Ambrose. He doesn't remember Cosmo. And he says he's one of the last patients that was subjected to this electroconvulsive therapy. And he says, you know, he was so docile, but I've come to believe that his docility was the result of him wanting to, can you re reconstruct this? Uh, Long, uh, that he was longing for an extinction as complete and irreversible as possible of his capacity to think and remember. One more time, please. Um, Longing, you were better. He was longing for an extinction as complete and irreversible as possible of his capacity to think and remember. Mm -hmm. What happened? What happened? So this story um, ends taking us back to, via his agenda, to 1913, their golden summer. And uh, matter of fact, the very last night, you wouldn't mind a chance to have the last uh, three paragraphs, would you? About on the third day? On the third day, do you uh, have? No. no. <laughs> mm -hmm. the third day of I go to, if you go to the end of the book, I believe, uh, end of that particular book. Uh, yes. I'm sorry. Yeah, but I, we, uh, it's, our edited version reads better. Um, he, um, they are having the vacation of the imagination. Horseback, they put out their saddles every night, they sleep under the stars, they have rugs and lanterns. One night on the uh, shores of the Dead Sea, um, a quail 
there's, I'm sorry, Cosmo is sleeping. A quail flies in and lands in Cosmo's lap and sits there for a long time until a breeze blows off of the Dead Sea. The quail uh, runs, stretches his arms, and then makes a beautiful swerve and disappears. The last thing that stuck with me was the description of memory, which is, but I'll read it in, let me see. Mm -hmm. The last entry in my great uncle Edelvar's little agenda book was written on the feast of Stephen or Stephen. Cosmo, it reads, had had a bad fever after the return from Jerusalem, but was already on the way to recovery again. My great uncle also noted that late the previous afternoon it had begun to snow and thus looking out of the hotel window at the city, white in the falling dusk, it made him think of times long ago. Memory, he added in a postscript, often strikes me as a kind of dumbness. It makes one's head heavy and giddy, as if one were not looking back down the receding perspectives of time, but rather down on the earth from a great height, from one of those towers whose tops are lost to view in the clouds. That hooked me on the book. This whole story I have stumbled through, um, I thought that, my God, how could I make a work that had this kind of what I call the origami feeling. Um, things folded in and out of sequence, refolded, told from another point of view. Um, and um, it made me start thinking about my whole body of work. It made me start thinking about what a dance company is, or we're no longer called company anymore. It's Bill T. Jones, Arnie Zane, company, as opposed to dance company because I'm trying to develop an ensemble capable of handling music, text, and movement equally. Um, here was an opportunity to uh, work with a dramaturg, to make a score. The dancers have to speak much of the text. I make an appearance as the narrator in a recording. Um, and this is what I thought uh, I was going to be doing, this book. I tried to put this book together with my mother-in-law's stories, a Jewish woman, um, and it was too much. So I just focused on her story, her oral history that I did for her son, my companion, my husband, and his brother, Ronnie, who lives in Paris. Um, it led me to make three pieces where I thought I was going to make one huge one. Dora was first followed by the piece that we premiered last night. Anyone see the piece last night? Oh, good. And there's people, which is built on an oral history with my nephew, Lance Theodore Briggs, a model, um, dancer, uh, choreographer, um, sex worker, and uh, cocaine addict. Um, that was the second part of the Analogy Trilogy. And then the third one, we're now returning to Ambrose, where it all started. So, is that clear now? <laughs> I'm sorry, but it is just this complicated. But I love this complexity. It's, it's delicious to me. Now, of course, I don't want to ruin the book for you, but I do encourage if you're readers, I imagine a lot of you are readers, the, the book is, has a lot going on in it that you'll find very rewarding. And as, and as uh, I'm sorry, your name, what's Jenny. It? Jenny told us there are four books, and this is number three out of four. How do we proceed? Do you want, you have some questions for yes, us? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. So much to say about this. Thank you. Your memory is quite impressive. I know you're very close to this work. But yeah. That's, um, yeah. It used to be that. better. <laughs> I also thought you were much, much, um, um, I imagined you very tall, of course, because you're this great figure. You shouldn't say that. Never say that again. Okay. <laughs> it, it's, a, it's a joke in the field. <laughs> People walk up and, the, and they always say, oh, I thought you'd be taller. <laughs> so now I'm telling you, just don't say it, even if you think it. Okay? <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> um, so one of the things I noticed, uh, what came to mind about the, the gambling um, when Cosmo and Ambrose were gambling, Mm -hmm. I sort of thought, is Ambrose helping him? Mm -hmm. Did you ever think of that? Like, and, what, and what do you mean? In the death? He's writing the consomme, it's like he's signaling to him, use the, you know. 
Oh, they're, they're, you mean, are they in cahoots? They're in cahoots together? Yeah. What would that mean to you if it was? I don't know. I don't know that he was so dedicated to Cosmo. He was so devoted um, mm -hmm. in his affection and attention and duties. That he, he would, would cheat for him. That he would yeah. cheat for him. Yes, but that might be just something I well, yeah, Or that you brought to it. Yes. Because why would you think that they necessarily uh, would have to cheat? Why couldn't Cosmo... Pardon? You can't cheat roulette since you're gambling on the number that the board is going to and you don't know the number. You can't, can't cheat roulette, that's what you said. Unless it's spinning but, no, but I think there's something here that, that there's something here you're getting at. See, I chose to look at their relationship as a very pure expression. First of all, it was all done under the radar. Uh, the official thing was the father gives this servant to his son to, in a way, enable the son, who is kind of crippled emotionally, to operate in the world. They form their own relationship. There's a scene at the, in the Normandy where they are, well, uh, he, the narrator has a dream when he returns to Deauville that he sees this vast dining room, you know, the golden age of the ocean liners? Imagine that, it's chic, vast dining room, but there in the center of it is a table and the two of them are sitting in their evening best, and they always sit together like equals, except that in the middle of the table, there is a lobster, a live lobster, that Ambrose is taking apart, as he always did, and putting little morsels in front of Cosmo, who eats it like a well-brought-up child. This is central to how I chose to see their relationship. One of my uh, colleagues, um, uh, Emily, who plays beautifully the piano in this, and um, Nick, both who happen to be gay people, she's married with a wife and a child. Uh, he, I don't think he's married, his friend, but they were, one day I was gonna take out the text about this lobster eater. And they said, no, you mustn't, because that's queer identity. Oh, interesting. Now, once again, we bring this language to it. Seabold never, ever says that they're gay, never says anything about homosexuality, never uses the word queer. So if there's something about reading, we bring to the reading. That's what I'm messing with you about, right? Yes. So I saw that as a very poor, a pure expression of uh, this man who is a savant and the other one who is literally born to serve. So much so that when the person that he served and loved the most dies, he's stuck for 27 years taking care of that man's family. And then when that family goes into demise, he is literally a shell. And he kills himself, the slowest, most painful way you can think of. That's my reading of it, you know? You know? Yeah, I love that, that image of the origami. Yeah. Um, because that's something I noticed about approaching the narrative is that he sort of starts, that the author starts in the middle uh, and then works backwards mm -hmm. and then more backwards and more mm -hmm. into those deeper, different lives that he, his aunt and his uncle, um, what their lives were like. And then he moves forward, finding mm -hmm. the San Antonio and the Ithaca. Um, yeah, that's, yeah, that was mm -hmm. unique. Each one of those stories, I think, does that. Yes. Do you want to talk about that style? Sure. And actually, I'm glad you mentioned it because I've been looking for an excuse to add a little detail, um, which is that there are actually two journeys happening at the same time in the novel. And you may have noticed in Bill's retelling that the perspective of the speaking voice shifts frequently throughout. And that's because the first journey is of this narrator who is literally retracing the steps of his great uncle, Alvar, and finding different people along the way who give him information. That just adds another sheet to this origami. Um, and so that the lobster eater part is a dream that this narrator has, that we see him creating something, adding it very furtively to the texture of the novel that's not historical, because the rest of the novel flirts with the idea of being historically accurate. And then the author allows himself this one moment to 
express something maybe more central to his feelings. Butterfly man? <laughs> That's another little detail that he has, um, through all four of the books, he has a figure of Nabokov, who was a great influence on him, who was also a what do you call that? Person oh, who collects uh, butterflies? No, a polygapodoptorist. Um, Lepidopterist. Uh, an entomologist <laughs> more generally, but specifically a lepidopterist. And um, in this particular novel, in this novella, in this chapter of the book, in the sanatorium, there's a man hopping around curiously on one foot, um, catching butterflies. And uh, Ambrose notices him and says it offhandedly. To Aunt Finney, to Aunt years Finney. ago, right? So you see the layers mm -hmm. of uh, recapitulation, how the story ends up in our hands. Um, and uh, and the, the odd twist that we discovered one day about the, this moment, this dramatic moment, is that Aunt Finney has a few comments like, who would visit Uncle Ambrose? Mm -hmm. And here, he says it in this very disparaging way. Well, it's the butterfly man, you know? As if like, oh, that sarcasm, which may or may not be true, is part of his just general manner. So at once, it's this reference to Nabokov, and rife with that, its own possibilities. And it's a, a little examination of their dramatic relationship, and who this man was. Mm -hmm. So there, we're back in the sanatorium. <laughs> I also wanted to mention, um, this time when you were speaking to these things, I felt like I should do story time and show pictures. Because there are images in the book, there are photographs of things that are associated with the story that sort of make you think, wait, I thought this was fiction. You know, mm. This is a real person's life. Is it a real person's life? Mm. And I just let go and decided that didn't matter whether it was, it was fiction or nonfiction. But um, I just think your it mattered. It, mat it mattered a bit to me, and I think it mattered to the piece in that um, there's a book I recommend if you're a Seaball fan. Um, it's called The Emergence of Memory. It's a collection of interviews with Seaball, who, as you know, died in a car accident in uh, uh, 97? 97. 97. So he didn't write nearly as much, considering that people like Susan Sontag uh, declared him the, one of the greatest novelists of the latter part of the 20th century. But we have only very few books. Um, the, uh, he, he implies in that book, someone asked him, is Ambrose Edelvard truly his uncle? He said, yes, he is. And then when you go back and read the story with that in mind, all of these details about Cosmo, about the gambling, about what happened in Germany, and so on and so forth, uh, there is a, there's a whole other way you read it when you think that it's really somebody's life. We're not supposed to care in fiction, are we? But because of the way that uh, Siebold writes, he is, you're never quite sure. I call him, Ambrose Edelvar, the quasi-novelistic invention. This is me using big words to say that we're not sure, because Dora is my companion's mother. Lance is my nephew. So everybody is real, except this one is from a novel, or is he? It just adds to the wonderful layers in this yes. book, and mm -hmm. a tremendous amount of detail and imagination and creativity. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of big themes, of course, that I um, bold. Um, and in, in association with the other stories, you know, how, you know, just connectedness. You know, this, this young boy, I think he, his early memory of Uncle Ambrose is coming home to Germany for the family reunion um, and hearing him speak, but not knowing what he spoke about. So I'm like, that's, that's a very realistic type of memory. Mm -hmm. um, and then you know, finding his aunts and uncles and doing research on his life, um, that's, that's a lot of interconnectedness and the depth of a person's life and what he learns about his uncle who worked on the roof of the synagogue. Um, so what are, what are some things, some themes you think maybe came from the book mm. into your work? Or is that not the way you're going to Um One more time. Oh, the question. One more time. Sure. 
It's a fair and good question. I would say that the person sitting in front of you, my concern was the construction of a work of art. The novel is the subject. Everyone in the company had to read the novel. All of the collaborators, lighting, costuming, uh, videogra videography, which is very, very important, had to read the book. So we'd all be looking at the same object. That was my first. Now, the book already hooked my heart with the story, which is very, it teases, because you find yourself projecting yourself into it. So the themes of the book, I felt were, well, actually I wasn't sure. By calling this work analogy, and I was on, um, I was Googling today, I wonder if Seabald, he died before we got to this, didn't he? But uh, what would it mean if I were to say that, um, the making of the book, making of these three pieces, how lighting is used, how people's bodies are used, musical fragments, decor, a bed, a cage-like thing that's taken apart, put together. Sometimes it's called the barracks, as in Dora, in these kind of holding camps. Sometimes it's called the cage, as in Lance, in a go-go bar. Um, in this piece, it is a bit more ambiguous. Those things were the things that I was most interested in. Are they, those devices, the same thing as themes? Mm -hmm. Analogy is the comparison of things that are often very different. These three lives are very, very different. I am forcing the analogy, if you will, to be in the way we dance, the way the stage looks, that is one level at which you can point to it and say that is analogous to all three pieces. I think that's a correct usage. Themes, sounds good to say this piece is about what is a life well lived in all three sections. That's a theme. Because um, that's a question I ask, what happened? You know, so your companion dies, your love dies. Well, you know, you live in Long Island. You, you know, you're probably a man that when he, when he, when Cosmo died, he's what, maybe 50? 50? 50. Move to the West Village. <laughs> you know, go find another companion. You know, there are gay people around. Why did you stay there as their servant? And then when they all died, you just sort of crinkle up. Why did your life stop? Is that a thing? What makes us want to live? Dora decided at age 19, while she was running through the streets of Antwerp trying to get laudanum to relieve her mother's pain dying from cancer, she decided that there are two kinds of people, those who need help and those who give help. And she was determined to be in the second group. And surely enough, I know the woman, she is a person with great integrity, a nurse, has worked in Africa, she has really try to be there, I'm not a bitter person, what have you. Uh, and then my nephew, who is struggling to find out after a year of, to use his own words, after years, 46 years of being in the fog of addiction, is trying to actually get his life together now. And he tells me every time I speak, uncle, I can't believe that life is like this, 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 and this, and I can't believe it. And I, you know, the things he's saying, a 17-year-old should be aware. But we love our loved ones where they're at, correct? Yeah. I sound like a saint, don't I? No, I'm very judgmental. Very judgmental, very controlling. But the fact is, this is where he's at. Ambrose, why didn't you get on with your life? So themes, yes, they're there. Some of them are as much as a sense, a scent of something. What is love in all three of them? There's a bed in all three of my pieces. 
the bed represents first the place that uh, Dora's mother, uh, Dora's beloved sister died of a botched abortion during the war because there was no penicillin. Um, the, the bed in the second one, my nephew is now paraplegic uh, from the life he lived and from the complications. Uh, the third one, the bed is, once again, is it the uh, electroconvulsive therapy? Is, that, is the bed then an idea? It is, for me, um, a symbol to be manipulated. Are symbols and great ideas the same thing? In my theater, theater world, they are. And they come from this wonderful book. Um, mm -hmm. And the title, you know, The Immigrants, is something we are all thinking about a lot, all the time. Well, but are we? A immigrant as opposed to immigrant. Should we talk about that a minute? Because that was that was been a learning curve for me. Do you know? Can someone say? Can someone say concisely what is the difference between immigrant I M M G R A N T and emigrant E M I G R A N T? Yes, ma'am. An immigrant goes somewhere, and an immigrant arrives. Uh huh. So in a way, it is. Yeah, an, an immigrant leaves their country. An immigrant comes to a new country, and to. And there's something about who is speaking when I say that this Mexican person who works in my yard is an immigrant to this country. I'm looking at him. He is, in my mind, an outsider here. He is an immigrant in his mind. He is now a stranger in a new world. Yeah. You are not so real to the people you leave behind as the people you leave behind are real. Mm. Would you say that once again? Do you, should you be on speaker? I'm, uh... Well, I, I'm an immigrant to the United States, mm -hmm. and I have noticed that in the process of leaving, the people that I have left, I think of them much more. You think of them more than they think of you. Well, I'm more. They're more real to me. How, how can you be so sure? I appreciate the emotion of it, but how can you be so sure how they feel about you? Well, I can't be. Yeah, yeah but, this, but you're having the immigrant's experience yes. that you in some ways have been eclipsed because you left, yes. right? Yeah, as Dora's uh, cousin Emma said uh, to her at her sister Manda's grave, it's your fault. You should have stayed in taking care of your family. And thank you for that, because that never landed. I never understood why that is so t such a hard thing to say to someone. Um, yes, so we have problems right now with immigration, I-M-M-G-R-A. Do we have problems with emigration, E-M-I-G-R-A-N-T? -E we may. Pardon? We may. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we may, the lady yes. says. Do you want to speak to that? <laughs> Well, I just think uh, in the climate of this country, mm -hmm. um, there will be people who will probably say, this is not the best place for me to be. Mm. And they will seek shelter, a home elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I said something to uh, a, a writer, and I think it was in Jackson Hole, and as I said, I said, Bill, I don't believe you just said what you said. But I, now, I was saying that we, pity at best and um, look down on immigrants. Poor thing. You couldn't make it in your country, so you had to come here. And but, yeah, but you know, what I'm saying, I think this is unexpressed. They are, their world is so unstable, they have to leave. I'm stable, this is my country. An immigrant, in some way, is somebody who has taken charge of their life. And they have put down their, their uh, roots in another place. Um, the emigrant that I usually think of is someone like Ambrose, who has skills, who has, uh, I don't know why I make this distinction, somebody who we, we need to make America great again, right? You know? I mean, it's, it's, it's sort of really shabby, isn't it? If you take apart what I'm saying. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Everybody in that room, they are like 
Yes. Yes. You know, yes, we are we are here and we are gonna make I, I just hate to use the word, I almost said the word no, G R C A G. But uh, you that, know, I mean they're just happy to be there and, and the energy is really high, it's really good. And the immigrants actually live longer than native citizens. And I think it's got to do with having a higher energy level. I just look there. No, I hear you, I hear you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, please. Adrian, is there any more you wanted to relate about your process or your inspirations? Oh, well, <laughs> well, just returning to the emigrant's discussion for a moment, I think Seaball, who was also a native German who left his country um, and lived most of his life in England, he locates himself by calling the book The Emigrants, he locates himself in relation to the stories he's telling. And I think that is also very important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, I think your, your question for Adrian about our process, about how did we um, end up with the text that we ended up with? Well, actually it was um, a real work of love because we're both so passionate about literature. And as you can tell, Bill is extremely detail-oriented. And so to get to go to work and close read a novel that's <laughs> this rich, um, what could be better, really? And we had a very interesting discussion one day about how people view dance and theater. And there are a combination of factors leading to this. I don't want to oversimplify, but I think people either aren't as educated visually in how to watch dance as they are in how to read a book, or they don't know how to trust visual media the way they trust the written word. Um, because we were very frustrated one day, and Bill was saying, what kind of crazy, why am I making a dance work but for, based on a novel? And I told him very honestly that I see the same layers of complexity in the dance work. The way certain choreographic repetitions occur from place to place are very analogous, if you will, to the way Seabald uses certain <coughs> images and symbols that just so subtly pop up but because of our education and the way it's a reproducible medium, you can read it over and over, you can pass it around. A dance piece is very hard to see multiple times. And he'll often say, well, for the quick eyes in the audience, and which is really just a, a self-effacing way of saying, we're putting so much work into the construction of this dance that may not be recognized. Mm -hmm. And I think that's just an unfortunate situation that mm -hmm. we're in. But you can trust us that we did put extreme amounts <laughs> of work into constructing the text. And we had to lose so much that we love, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, we started with a libretto of, I don't know how many pages, <laughs> 50 pages probably, 40 pages and it worked its way down to 19 or 18. Mm -hmm. um, but how do we keep those important details, those facts that for the quick years might lead to the kind of discovery that it led us to in understanding the characters and in the context of the piece, understanding the trilogy. Um, Dora was also struck dumb Mm -hmm. at a particular moment. How do you mean? What do you mean? Then? Just quite literally, she says, and I had never noticed it actually, but in Dora, she says, Oh, abit, habit, abite. Yes. Right. Is that and the I terms? Heard, that the, oh, no, it's uh, What is the word, Bjorn? Ebite. Ebite, yes. in French, which means dazed. Dazed. Right. I hadn't thought but of she that. she has all my... <laughs> yeah. Um, so anyway, yes. That our process was um, lovely and difficult because we did have to cut so much that we just relished day after day. Mm -hmm. oh, well, before we go on, do, do you all agree with what he was saying about the, the difference between reading and looking? Um, and, and 
that people trust words more than they, here I'm speaking off, but do, do we, do people trust words more than you do um, non, non-verbal? Trust. Pardon? You have to define trust. <laughs> For that, I would say that. I love this. We have a literary folk. We're going to define trust. Get your turn. No, I think you're, in watching dance, um, you, there's a story there that sort of washes over you like a tree. Whereas when you're reading, you have thoughts that are tethered to a text, so and you can come back to mm. that. But with, for me, I see dance more as something that's, I don't even try to put meaning behind it as much as just let it somehow be more impressionistic. Mm. For me, but I'm sure because you're within the profession and you're the choreographer, mm. you have overthought every single thing is, I, and it's, but then for me as the viewer, I would sort of just trust the feeling. Ah, yeah. trust me, the feeling. I guess the movement lands, watching dance, watching your pieces and other pieces that have affected me, it's they're speaking directly to my body, they're speaking directly to my emotion. When I'm reading, it's not that I'm unemotional, but my thinking brain is involved in a different way. Mm-hmm. I analyze it. <laughs> And I sometimes can do that after, you know, a piece of yours looking, you know, at it on the, the second time or third mm-hmm. time, I begin to engage that thinking function mm-hmm. more and see, connect dots. But the initial receipt for me, it's like it bypasses this judging piece of my mm-hmm. head and it comes, it's like it's coming straight in to my experience. And for me, that's transformation. That opens a door for transformation. Mm-hmm. And the things that has touched me so deeply in the, since the first time I saw you at ADF, whenever that was, really? mm-hmm. so many years 1981. ago. 1981. Mm-hmm. Soon after they moved to Durham. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so. uh, well, you and I are natural allies, but then why am I so perverse that I would want to, um, if, if dance is this pure land, direct communication, nonverbal communication. That's what they tell us in college. Dance is supposed to be the thing that transcends boundaries, transcends language, transcends race, gender. Let me take it from me. There's, a, there's blood in the streets in dance right now about this very idea. Well, so, but, but I feel like in this piece, I am, uh, now we're getting, closing in on what is really driving me. I'm going to expect you, those of you who have seen the works, and this one in particular, to sit in the theater and be able to do both things. And is that, well, is it fair? You know, artists are not known to be fair. Um, (laughs) But uh, is it, some people get angry. Yeah, no, I I, I, I can understand that. And I I remember, yeah, changes in, I remember the first time Palabalus appeared in ADF, and everyone was like, that's not (laughs) dance. And, and it's, you know, so the, I think for me the difference in when I, when I receive text, as I have in some of the other pieces of the trilogy that, that I've been able to see so far, I'm sinking into my body and it's like I'm hearing the text with a different ear. Mm. Well, you're a great audience member. Yes. Um, it's like, yeah. 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 It's just a shift. Okay, sorry. I just want to thank the People's Channel for being here today. They are recording, and I would ask you a huge favor, if you have a question, to do what I did and come up and speak into both microphones. I'll run back and forth, um, just so we can get it on the recording, because otherwise it won't show up. (laughs) Okay, all right. I know, it's awkward. I am also a strong proponent for the hard of hearing. Yeah. So many of these programs. This beautiful building was designed by Phil Freelon, the great Phil Freelon. The acoustics are wonderful, but um, not perfect for recording. Thank you. Uh I see. I just wanted to say one more. Is this working? Uh, One more (laughs) thought on the barriers, perhaps, for people watching dance as opposed to reading. Uh, I found when I bring people to watch dance who don't know dance, they say at the end, oh, I don't know, like, what? I don't know what was going on, but I probe further, and then all of a sudden they have opinions, they have connections they've made. It's all about feeling empowered to have those opinions. Mm. People are in school, you're assigned to comment, whether you actually have thoughts or not. But uh, yeah, I think for dance, that's what I've found 
when I've tried to coax people to think a little harder or speak a little more. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's, let's keep going. I don't think this. Yes. The question was, is the lobster alive? The Pardon? lobster was pink. Yeah. Oh, he couldn't have yeah. been alive then. He must have been Well, cooked. he was making strange squeaking sounds every now and then. <laughs> no, and you realize, of course, that this is a dream. This is a dream the narrator is having as he goes searching for the two. So it, I also saw it as a pink lobster that is moving. Uh, but it this doesn't really matter, does it? That it's a dream. <laughs> All right, well, speaking as one of the people that my daughter has been bringing to dances for years, <laughs> and an English major, I could take this book and do a whole paper tonight on the use of imagery connected with ruins. Mm. But I don't feel I have... Connected to? Ruins. His ruins. Use of ruins. Mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. Ruin people, ruin landscapes. But... I still, even after all these years of watching and enjoying dance, feel like I don't have the toolkit. So what you were saying about all of the deep levels you were trying to put in, like the repetition, what should we look for tonight? Mm. Those of us who want to engage in a Have you seen any of the others? What? No, I've, I've watched some on video oh, last that's night. Too and, bad. and Kim oh, yeah. has seen them and has told us how wonderful they are. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah. But we, we came, and we drove an hour and a half to come see you today. Thank you. Thank so, you for being um, here. But the um, toolkit, what, what should we look for tonight? Well, the first thing I would say, what you should do is relax. Okay. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, I mean that. When you, uh, you know, because there's levels that of, there's levels of our knowing, isn't there? You know, uh, when you walk into the room, you just take a check on wh- how am I feeling right now? Am I still in the parking lot? Am I anxious? Am I whatever? People around me, lights go down and you see something. You see two people, a woman starts running and you hear this uh, narrator, listen to what the narrator is saying, but don't get stuck because another event is going to come through and the events will begin to recur. When they recur, you will unconsciously or not remember the first time you saw it and you'll be doing this comparison thing. That's your mind, because that's what the mind is. It is an organizer and I'm an artist like uh, like myself. I'm really interested in your mind being a collaborator. You will often be my adversary. You'll often say, that was such a beautiful sequence, but what would, he was over here talking about that, and he made me not give myself completely to that. Forgive me, and move on. Because at that moment, your mind probably took in more than you thought. So um, I would say, um, listen as much as you watch. And when you find that you run into an, um, a roadblock and that the, something too much is happening, just take a breath. You're allowed to step out for a moment and then come back in and see what does connect. I always say, for my work, and I dare say a lot of work, um, watch yourself watching. Mm-hmm. That is, um, it sounds very self-involved, but I think that's the key to the subjectivity of the modernism and that you are in position, you are in control and you can't do it wrong. Or you, I miss, I'm going to miss something. You get what you get, and more gets in than you think. And come see it again. <laughs> or go see the next thing and think about these same issues. It is a commitment to a way of thinking, a way of being, which is what I call um, art, the, the exchange in art. Um, yeah, I can't say more than that. I have my favorite moments, but I would... I would say, um, just watch, and then you and your daughter talk about it later. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Have drinks. Have drinks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, oh, dreams. Oh, I said, that's better. Mm-hmm. Um, hi. Hi. Uh, your question about literature and dance. Mm-hmm. Um, I keep coming to modern dance. Were you there the other night? Yeah. 
And we had a good exchange because you had seen Dora two years ago, right? I've yes. seen, I've, yeah, yeah. Good, good, good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, um, and on your recommendation, I've been reading this book. Mm -hmm. And the first time I read it, I didn't understand it at all. And I just did you go right to Ambrose, or did you try to read the no, whole thing? I read thing? the whole thing. I had my book club read it. Yeah. So I read the whole thing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I just read it feeling like, I don't understand this. I don't, mm -hmm. I just, um, and then when I saw about this, I reread, I only reread the Ambrose part. Mm -hmm. just and I started to get it, just mm -hmm. like seeing your pieces again and again, you know, they go deeper. Yeah, yeah. And just to sidetrack why I keep watching dance is because I'm always inspired. Mm -hmm. I just always leave and there's something that's just edgy and exciting and sparks me somehow mm -hmm. and feeds into my work as a yoga therapist. So a I what, always, what a yoga therapist. Yoga therapist, ah. Huh. Um, and the, the process that I noticed as I was rereading is how much more personal his um, understanding of Ambrose becomes as he goes from sort of the family into Aunt Finney and that, you know, mm -hmm, following. Mm -hmm. Um, and it surprisingly took me a really long time to figure out that I grew up in New York. Um, and I kind of did the same thing. I chased down my grandmother who mm -hmm. had been hospitalized and had all electroshock treatment and a lobotomy and had been institutionalized from the mid 40s until she died in 2006. Um, that's, that's Ambrose's period, huh? And I never spoke this in a group before. It's been a huge part of my life. Um, but as part of the reason I'm so shaky right now is when you said what drives you as an artist, mm. when I was rereading, I'm thinking, well, why does this character care so much about his great uncle that he would go mm. through all this? And it took me a really long time to realize that because that person right. did exactly what I did, which mm -hmm. is what I needed to do. And I don't think we always understand mm -hmm. why we're driven in particular ways. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and somehow dance just helps me, movement in general helps me understand mm -hmm. all of that. Yeah. May I, may I respond? That's really lovely. Plus, I'm glad we've had two points of contact in this last couple of days. This is great. A um, couple of things. The, uh, he, he's German, the writer. And um, when we did this in Jackson Hole, a young man came up who actually was the boyfriend of somebody. He just happened to be there at the performance and said, man, you know, I think I heard your piece in a way nobody else in this room could. You see, I'm German. And he said, the, he said uh, Ambrose would have been my grandfather. And he said, you don't understand. No one understands how Germans of that generation the problem they had with memory. It's a thing, memory. Now, I can only imagine, but I think he means something more like, you know, the French supposedly have a preoccupation with food. He thinks that the Germans have this preoccupation with the mind and memory. So that's one thing that I think Seabold was going for. You know, this why it was so important, this to uh, Ambrose, is it a metaphorical statement? Could you give it once again? What was he doing with his docility? Oh, Longing uh, for? Longing for an extinction as total and irreversible as possible of his capacity to think and remember. Right. And when you have a lot that you don't like about yourself, yeah. you, um, yeah. 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 And then I don't think, you know, here's it. I think that, that mea culpa of uh, Germans of his generation mm -hmm. is very real. So that's one level. It might be selling the novel short, but that might be one thing that is going on in this novel about the struggle to remember or not to remember. And to carry your ancestors' experiences with you. And to carry your ancestors' experience with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, you used the term, uh, uh, ru uh, no, the lady did, ruins, who, who, ruins you could teach. Uh, he has, the, the, another one of his books I really recommend is uh, History of Destruction. Of course you wrote that. Yes, right, right. And so there's, he's really obsessed with this idea of how things are fall, fall down. And uh, so memory, destruction, ruins. We spend a lot of time talking, you're a yoga instructor, about healing. Uh, Sleepball didn't get that memo. <laughs> Uh, and this is maybe he didn't live long enough, but I wonder what does it mean to a person who, when he looks at the human experience, he sees the history of things coming up and, and being destroyed. Um, but the telling of the story is a healing. I mean, 
the whole writing of it is a healing. Because why was he so driven? I mean, he flew uh, Well, healing for whom? Right. right. I mean, but I think it, I love it. It feeds my soul. Um, but was his, is his objective, is his responsibility to make us feel better about ourselves and our world? This is a big question about art. Mm -hmm. And I think everybody has to decide for themselves, what do you want art to do? Right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? I just want to make just a few generalities of my thoughts are disordered. But please use the microphone. Okay. You know, I always think about was it W. B. Yeats that said, "How do you tell the dancer from the dance?" Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I always remember about that. Um, okay. Um, Whenever I see a play on stage or see a dance, I think that it's about the fourth wall and it's the willing suspension of disbelief because what I am watching up there is not the real world. It's, it, it's, it's just a, you know, just a creative, um, um, just a, a creation of, of what something can be. But I have not read Emigrants. I tried, I did read Austerlitz mm -hmm. by Siebold. It is very difficult. I never knew where I was in the novel. But that narrator, and I always think about, oh, is this the English teacher thinking about? The narrator, you always have to question the reliability of the narrator. How reliable mm -hmm. is that narrator? Mm -hmm. Naive, mm -hmm. some, you know, the, the naivete of a, of, a, uh, of a narrator, and how accurate are those memories and whatever. But that is the beauty mm -hmm. of anything like, um, like, like um, that Seaboard has uh, put together. Um, I do want to try to read The Emigrants, but I tell you that. That just go, Oscar. just go to Ambrose. Just try to read Ambrose first. Ambrose first, okay. all right. You know, because yeah. he's number okay. three, you know, in in line out of four. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah. that I will try. But anyway, um, just um, um, then, just one last thing. What was I reading the other day? I don't remember. But somebody once said, um, maybe it was Picasso or Einstein that said, you know, art disturbs, but mm. sometimes reassures. And that's mm. the beauty of art because whether it's a film you're watching or, a, or one of your dances, and you can walk out of that venue, out of that auditorium, and actually discuss something instead of these, these bombastic movies. What are you going to say about it? <laughs> but something as. Oh, so you don't I'm, see a Hollywood movie as art? Oh, oh, I won't go to see any of those Transformers. I don't know if these Oh, that's yeah. horrible. <laughs> horrible. No, 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 no. But, see a foreign film. I'm going to see a foreign film because I know I can talk about a, a foreign film. There's lots of things to talk about. Mm -hmm. Or a serious film, but anyway. Well, let me let me take it. That, you are really I, that's quite a that's quite a hedge you got going on there, right? But let me. Uh, I think you owe it to you owe it to yourself, and let you and I. To, you've got to go see young choreographers working now. This, it's not even a no, new idea, but that fourth wall has been blown apart mm -hmm. and they are constantly messing with your expectation mm -hmm. that what you see up here is safely behind glass and supposed to have symbolic metaphorical reach. They want to literally feel the weight of your body on that chair and they want you to feel it and they want to know the distance between us now, there are people who are working to close that distance like this, right? Ooh, or be behind you or whatever. So there's a lot of thought right now about what we perceive to be the role of the um, audience and the role of the performer in the dance world. It's unsettling. Sometimes you, I don't like it, but I think I see what they're going for. And also in our space, we have a program called Fresh Tracks. These are young people making from their first. And we did a couple of years ago, a series, there's usually five or six on the program, Almost all of them, you couldn't tell when it started, and you didn't know when it ended. <laughs> and many of them did not come back and take bows. So this whole idea about art and life, and that's, I didn't think it was new already. Um, art, art performs life, or everything in this room, depending on how it's framed, could be performance. So where does the um, authorship exist? 
It is in the way I direct your focus. A big, and, and not such a fresh discussion, but it's important for us to know it's not so safe anymore. Mm -hmm. um, I wish I could say that with my ambition in the business of art, having to move pieces around, having to get them up, having to be legible for I want a larger audience, I don't want, this is a very convenient a downtown audience, a small, I can, you know, how close I am. But what if you really want to play in a room that has a thousand people in it? Mm -hmm. 1,500, 2,000 people. What does the work have to be like? Uh, so those questions are also uh, pulling and pushing against what's created. Yes. Uh, so glad to hear you talk about memory and the ephemeral nature of a dance performance, which I mean, I try so hard to absorb it all in, in once mm -hmm. because you're not going to be able to go back and reread it. Mm -hmm. You have to be very present. So. Something I do to help my memory is when I leave the D-pack is go into that grassy area where no one can see me and do a few of the moves. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Some of the, you know, and Mark Morris, there's some very easy things that my niece and I can pretend that, you know, mm -hmm. just, and it, it helps me. That's, that's one thing. One trick, a tip mm -hmm. for you all. I'll see you on the grass at D-pack tonight <laughs> to imitate some, some moves. Um, and on a personal note, my, my grandmother uh, is from she was born in Cologne, Germany, and moved to Berlin, where she met my grandfather. And they both escaped from that area before the war. Uh, she went through South Africa, and he went back to New York. Are you Jewish? My father's side of the family is Jewish, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. I did not inherit any um, religion. My mother was Catholic. Mm -hmm. um, oh, that, that didn't matter to oh, that. Yes. That didn't matter to the Nazis. <laughs> sure. No, no, yes. no. no yes. I asked the question because yes. are you Jewish? Yes is many people who are non-religious also went to the ovens, right? So uh, it's, it's another whole issue when we talk about Judaism. And isn't it strange at the end of the novel that when they go, uh, I mean, what did you think? Cosmo hates this city. What was that about? Uh, he loved Constantinople, he loved these other places, but what was it that he, um, and why did the last emphasis fall on Jerusalem and Israel, right? This is a very, uh, I don't think I quite, do you have a feeling about that? <laughs> I can resist. It's that image, that stark mm -hmm. image. Um, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> Do you want to say something about the image? Just that the image that, of them, you know, camping in this beautiful area, but the city looks so completely just, I mean, there are no trees, there's nothing. There's a beautiful nightscape, but... Um, it looks like a scene of devastation or destruction. Exactly. Mm -hmm. It's like it is falling apart and disgusting, I mean, the way you described it. Yeah, it's true. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's a, it's a disturbing image because on one hand you have the... Um, literally sewage in the streets um, and on the other hand you have people selling cheap trinkets and so in a way it combines both the mm. images of destruction that are literal destruction the ruins but also with Siebold's contemporary idea of what destruction is our contemporary um, values va yes destruction of values um, the infinitely reproducible objects that you can just sell off at whatever price. And so his Jerusalem really contains thousands of years of destruction leading up to this one. And I think that's a, a very powerful point. The fact that this young Jewish man, Americanized in, in all of its <laughs> uh, repercussions, um, who probably doesn't connect to being Jewish, his own Jewish heritage, but is probably immediately recognizable as a Jew, who might be gay, who might, and who knows how recognizable that is. There are certain moments that you're tempted to think people do see them as gay, but you're not sure. The fact that he hates the city right on the eve of the creation of Israel um, just after the second major Aliyah movement. Um, it's a very powerful one that I think many of us American Jews relate to. 
even without going into the contemporary politics of Israel, the establishment of that state in that moment of destruction and how it was reified by the Jewish interest in creating a homeland, I think is more poignant and probably has much more value than certainly I would know to speak about. <laughs> Thank you for using, remember my homework assignment last night? Oh. <laughs> was anybody in the audience last night? Do you remember what the assignment had been? <laughs> reification. reification. Go look up, what does it mean? What does reification mean? Pardon? Yes, ma'am. You want the microphone? Because I told them, I said that I thought that that's what I'm trying to do in the Analogy Trilogy. I'm looking for reification. Well, it's, it's a very complex subject, apparently, and I, I can't believe I've never heard of it before. Mm -hmm. But it's taking something immaterial or abstract and making it into something physical and, yes. and real. Right. Um, an example that was given is the uh, wedding ring is the reification of a couple's love. Ah. Mm -hmm. But I also found other definitions, which is that it's also um, the objectification of a person. Oh, I like, didn't know I that. Know, I know, yeah, Google. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so, so taking a person and making them into something abstract, and it was somebody how Marx resented the fact that spoke of labor, rather than the people as work, you know, workers, mm -hmm. just, it, was, it was making the people into a commodity, labor. Uh-huh, and that's an example of reification. Yeah, yeah, so, and mm -hmm. then, <laughs> and the third thing I found was that, um, what was it, in, it said like, which I'm not familiar with, gestalt psychology, because <laughs> <laughs> it, it, um, it's, um, the idea of when you look at a thing, you see it as its whole, before you see it as a combination of its parts. So, oh, wow, I yeah. didn't know that one, yeah. So, Google, thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> interesting, interesting, yeah, yeah. Good Yeah, thank you, thank you. <laughs> well, if that's being said, I particularly like the first one, but I think the other, the second one might also work. Um, what is the analogy trying to reify? Mm -hmm. What is there that is spiritual or abstract that I am trying to make concrete and material? I should be answering it, right? But it's more fun if you do, <laughs> particularly. <laughs> I'm sorry? Oh, no, I'm sorry? Did you say loss, did you say? A oh, loss of memory, the it's a, a extinction of memory. Uh, but you don't want to say it at the microphone now, do you? <laughs> I'm curious, actually, how you uh, are going to portray that tonight. Does the, the quote that you read twice about the mm -hmm. extinction of memory, I know you mentioned the bad. Well, let me say, first of all, the, the question was, uh, she's the lady is curious how we're going to portray that tonight. We don't portray. Not we ex uh, demonstrate okay. something that may, in fact, lead you to um, an apprehension or an experience of something. So the, the piece is quite evocative and associative. It is the... Where is the there there? Oh, you can't see it. You can only see it out of, out of your peripheral vision because when you move, it's gone away. Do you have those experiences in life? That's why I feel like I'm living more and more in middle age, right? Is that everything that used to be so clearly right there is now, it's moved or, or I have forgotten it. I remember there used to be something here, but now I've forgotten it, right? The lady wants to say something. Or you perceive it quite. There are so many changes. So many changes. And I'll tell you, I'm 80. And you're 80. Love it. And you're a beautiful 80. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> but I look at what life was like. She looks at what life was like. Growing up, and it's so different. It's mm -hmm. foreign. And I'm having great difficulty. 
great difficulty understanding in understanding young people's attitudes. Young people's attitudes. <laughs> actions. Actions. You know, it's like a loss of empathy. Loss of empathy. Yes. And all of those things. Respect. Respect. <laughs> I have difficulty relating, ladies. And I have gone into the new technology, kicking and screaming. <laughs> and she's gone into the new technology, kicking and screaming, right? I have, I have finally surrendered. Oh, you've oh, surrendered. And succumbed. And succumbed. <laughs> ah, that's the smart ball. <laughs> now. No, you're, you're so wonderful. Don't you want me to, you want to take the microphone? Yes, <laughs> Should we, well, at least, at least let me hand it to you so you don't have to come up to, if you don't want to, at least let me hand it Bless to your you. What's your, what's your name now? Marjorie. Marjorie, please. Marjorie, yes. <laughs> now you made me tell get what I was going to say. <laughs> no, oh, we need that, things, we need that one? One of the things that you spoke about when you talked oh. about. Okay, hold on. I understand we have to have two microphones. The emigrant with an E. <laughs> I'm kicking and screaming. <laughs> Please, the immigrant with an E. All right, the immigrant with an E and the immigrant I am. I have reflected back on my family history. My family, the born in America, we were immigrants as we moved from the oppression in the South mm. to supposedly a new life in the North. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All, you know, how we perceive something mm -hmm. is all a result of our own life. Right. Mm. When you talk about going to see dance and you're trying to interpret it, I just enjoy it. But one of the things that I have found if you see it, the same dance, again, and again, and again, <laughs> you understand it to a greater depth. And that's part of the problem with people not understanding mm -hmm. dance. They see it once, well, that was kind of silly, didn't seem to make much sense to me. But if you really take the time mm -hmm. to get a background, of what the dance is about, mm -hmm. or the story, or the book. Before you delve into it, you're far, you're far better off than just going with a blank screen. But now Marjorie, now when you say, am I this, this strange construction, that, did you see any of them yet? No. Oh, well. <laughs> Because they're going to be kind of, you're going to like, we've been talking, you're going, there's a lot of levels in which you're going to be, be expected to juggle the narrative, the use of language, the music, and the movement, personality speaking. So I hope you keep that same generosity of spirit <laughs> about the experience you're going to have. Are you coming to the show? I don't have a ticket. Oh, come on. We can get you a ticket. We can get you a ticket. No, you've got to come to the show after that impassioned statement, right? But Marjorie, but now, should we, should we be giving? Are there any, um, you know, we just done a little millennial bashing here, right? Right, it happens all the time. I, I swore I will not do this again, but I'm thinking, yeah, you're right, yeah. Does anybody of, that gen of the younger generation want to get in there and actually um, engage? Our, our Marjorie here. Please. <laughs> yes. Does anybody want to? Ah, uh, Serena, Sierra. <laughs> Do you want to engage? I hate, but, uh, Sierra is our wonderful handler and she is one of the very, so um, I put her on the spot, but do you want to talk about what? What are the accusations? Are they accusations? Oh, are we done? Thank you so much, Marjorie. Good, good, good. Thank you. Thank you. What was the question again? Well. 
what was the, what was the uh, indictment? It sounds so aggressive, doesn't it? What were the points that Marjorie was making about <laughs> loss of empathy, um, disrespect, respect. although that was yours, respect. not, yeah, not respect. Um, looking at the surface only. Looking at the surface only. You see, it all comes out. Once you <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I, so I'm 21 years old. <laughs> right. um, and I, have actually, I find myself uh, thinking about this a lot um, in my generation. I, as I told Bill before, I actually have a little bit of a different experience, um, being that I was raised by my grandparents, mm -hmm. um, and who are 73 and 89 years old. <laughs> um, and so I was raised in a very strict household, um, raised with like, we don't tolerate disrespect. <laughs> mm -hmm. You don't talk back. Um, you do, you, getting the stories of back in the day, um, and kind of just like understanding um, people um, from a not so shallow point of view. Um, and I think that a lot of, so like a lot of what my generation is taught um, is that there's always the next best thing out there. Um, and because of that, because they feel like there's the next best thing, they don't like the idea of commitment, commitment to anything. Um, be that I'm gonna read the first five pages of this book and put it down and never read it again, or be that I'm not gonna get a job, I'm just gonna go with the flow and hope that life happens to me. Um, <laughs> um, and I see that a lot, especially since I'm going into my last year of um, college and I'm starting to have to make those decisions of life and what I'm going to do. But now it sounds like you are agreeing with our uh, articulate market. Mar but no, how do you how do you push back? I mean, what would you say? Wait a minute, hold up, hold up. There are our generation the things that are good about our generation. What would you what would you say about it? Um, I do think that there are some good things about all of the technology that is ha has been handed to us. Mm. Um, with that technology, we're allowed to dig deeper if we want to dig deeper. Um, literally everything is at our fingertips. Um, mm -hmm. We don't have to, we don't, we don't have the challenge of anymore having to drive or ride our bikes to the library to have to research something. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I, I'd love your opinion on that. <laughs> the challenge. But it's right? online, it's online for us. Um, so that's a good thing. It's a good thing because the library is now online. But it's funny because I have a 10-year-old brother who I still make go to the library um, and get off of his iPad and his phone and get outside and ride a bike. Um, because it's, it's just, it's funny because now that we have, I always tell my mom this, um, and I'm always like, Mom, why are you letting him sit on the couch with an iPad when he needs to be outside riding his bike or like reading a book or something like that? And it's just, it, I don't know, it's, I feel like our parents are now kind of giving in <laughs> um, <laughs> to all the technology and all of all, mm -hmm. everything being at our fingertips. Um, mm -hmm. And it's, it's amazing to are, me. <laughs> um, are, are your, is your generation more open-minded? more accepting? I think so. Yes, statistically speaking, yes. However. What, what did you say? You said? I said statistically speaking, yes, we are more accepting. Yes. More open-minded. Yes. Curious? More open-minded. More curious, yes. Ah, curiosity is more up for debate. Harder for debate. to quantify? Harder to quantify? Yes. Yeah. I think that we're open to more things because we have more choices to choose from. Ah, mm -hmm. I don't think that we, that we would be more open to things if we did not have all the choices that we have to choose from because of our lack of wanting to dig deeper. Mm -hmm. We mm -hmm. just say, oh, there's so many things that we can choose from, and I'm okay with that. I'll choose one of them and move on. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Did you want to say anything, uh, Madame Librarian? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, thank you, Sierra, thank you. Okay. Maybe I've heard the headlines that millennials have saved the library by, because they use it more. They come, we have internet access. You know, we have 
so many resources that you subscribe to, so even if they're online, they're not always free. So sometimes you go to your university or the library, um, and there's a, a saying that says, if you want an answer, ask Google. If you want the right answer, ask a library. <laughs> Yes, anybody can Google, but you still need to be able to discern, mm. to be able to become digitally literate, and to be able to tell something that's real from not. And there's all these little adjustments you're making in your brain when you see that list of answers that comes up on Google. Okay, I know that's not going to be it. Okay, and that's not going to be it. And when I, you know, I Googled Bill T. Jones <laughs> to talk about him today. And, you know, there was the Britannica, you know, it's like, okay, that's a reliable resource. <laughs> Not everyone knows that. And we have digital literacy classes to try to help people who are brand new to it. And I love that we celebrate her cell phone at 80. I got my work email on my cell phone yesterday. <laughs> I was just getting Gmail, and I thought, you know, I know Shannon's going to want to email me, and I won't be in the right place in front of my desk. I've got to get this done. And I just mm -hmm. felt a little embarrassed, and I asked the tech guy, and he was like, oh, just download this app, and there it was. And it's, it's could, could I, uh, I, we're going to pro we probably should wind up soon, right? But let me say one other thing about the, my cast, right? They're uh, very talented. Many of them are old enough to be my children you know, or I'm old enough to be their father or even grandfather in certain cases. But one thing in this book, I just said, everyone had to read it. So in a way, the piece is a portrait of a community of people looking at the same object and thinking about it. So you will see in tonight's videotape what, what we call confessionals. And I believe there's four and there's five, one of them without sound. The confessionals were at when we were in uh, Wickenburg they were all supposed to have read the book. Now this is, the teachers in the room know what that is like, but uh, they were supposed, and now in the rehearsal the first day I said, okay, take your smartphones, go into a corner, and now tell me the story. And now when you tell me the story, now tell me what, give me, how did it, what was it, what did it mean to you, right? Some of those um, came out in such a way that they serve um, something that this piece is about, thinking about thinking, making, construction. Those actual confessionals break the fourth wall in their own way because now you see them talking as themselves, as people. And they have their, their headphones on and they're talking into it and the color of it is so unreal and so on. So um, we're very aware of this discussion that we're having today and I wanted the work to show that um, that's going on in the work. We're a community of people trying to get their arms around a thing, and the thing happens to be Seaball's book, um, The Immigrants. And I think that, should we, uh, is there anything else anyone else like, would like to say? Questions, comments? Yeah, because I'm going to the theater now for the tech. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you.